Welcome to Stories of Sacrifice, American POWMIA's podcast, the voice of the missing in action and those that are buried as unknowns in our national cemetery. I'm your host and lead researcher, John Baer. Just a boy turning 17 Took me away from my home in Abilene I was sworn I'm a soldier now I was trained to survive And from a boy I became a man We journeyed to a place called Nam Spent 13 months of living in fear They say it's over, but I'm still here Hey America, can you hear me? Don't you remember me? Hey America, can you hear me? Why don't you send me free? Hey America, can you hear me? Welcome, everybody, to Stories of Sacrifice. So tonight, I've got uh, David McMillan with us again, and we got a special guest tonight, uh, Mike Henshaw. Uh, Mike was uh, retired from the U.S. Army in 2009 after 25 years of service, where he served as a mortuary affairs non-commissioned officer in charge of missing in action search and recovery teams that were responsible for locating and recovering and repatriating the remains of our U.S. service members missing overseas from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. How you doing tonight, guys? Great. Going great. How you going? Good, John. Good, good. You hear us, Mike? I'm great. Thank you. How you doing tonight, guys? Yeah, so I'm getting some. Great. Going great. How you going? Pardon me, sorry, I just had a little bit of some type of playback issue. Um, yeah, I'm hearing it too. You got YouTube there? Yeah, so I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. That I don't know what sorry. That, I didn't know what was happening. Sorry, guys. Pardon me. No worry, no wonder it was going crazy like that. Sorry, pardon me. So yeah, welcome to Stories of Sacrifice no and um Michael Henschel. Um I, I really wanted to have Mike on tonight because Mike was instrumental in getting me involved in the MIA POW mission. And Michael is really his wealth of experience when it comes to um, the the US mission is uh, there's really nobody else that knows as much about the type of work that Mike knows as far as field operations are concerned as well and, uh, and the theory of it as well. So um, I'm really... Uh, I can't thank you enough, Michael, for joining us tonight. I'm sorry for that little malfunction with the YouTube just a second ago. Yeah, no, great. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Okay, it Mike. Be, so, it wouldn't, um, be a good story as a sacrifice. wouldn't be a good story as a sacrifice without a little malfunction in there every once in a while. I think the last time that Michael did a podcast was probably back in 2018 in Cambodia where you did a podcast for with the French guys about the Khmer Rouge, Mike. So, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was the last time, yeah. yeah. Cool, man. So, yeah, welcome. So, um, well, where do you, where do you, where can we get started when it comes to you, sir? Um, what can you tell us? Where did you, how did you first originally get involved in the MIA POW mission? Uh, I, I was in the 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii in, uh, 1995 and I was at the end of my tour there and I went to re-enlist and they they offered me a huge bunch of jobs and one of them was <clears throat> cavalry scout which I was before that was my first MOS so I was like hell yeah I'm going back and my boss Master Sergeant Fry William Fry great guy we're still great friends he said hey come to lunch with me so he took me to Hickam 
Air Force Base, and he took me to the lab at Silhai. Back then, it was Central Identification Laboratory, of Hawaii, Silhai. And he said, "Yep." He, he said, "Hey, I know you. This is what these guys do. They go out and they they go around the world and they they look for and recover missing service member from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. I think this is." perfect for you. you don't need to go back and be a cab scout because what are you going to do you know what are you going to do when you yeah. get out so he was right and i went back to the reenlistment nco and i said hey you got this graves registration job thing open and he said hell yeah we got it so i ended up in the 101st airborne for a couple of years doing graves registration and then they changed the name to mortuary affairs um and then i ended okay. up i ended up at sill high doing recovery so that was Pretty much how it all started. Okay, John. So, what are what are some of the first John cases Bear, you, you worked any? on? Yeah, what what are some of the first cases you worked on? Uh, was it World War Two, Korea, Vietnam? Which which one did they? What uh, when I got to when I got to so high, I was a, a mortuary affairs um, NCO. So on each search and recovery team, you got the core team, which is a couple 92 mics or used to be 57 foxtrots um and then you have a, a team sergeant senior team sergeant which is also typically back then um a mortuary affairs and senior nco and then you'll have a couple other people and then when you deploy you have augmentees um from either internal or external linguists um life support analysts and and this type of stuff so um did that answer the question? <laughs> I, I think I got yeah. off track. Oh, like, like, what type right. of yeah, like, what? What's that? Cool. Yeah. Go ahead, David. I was just going to say, yeah. So it's just like, um, what? So yeah, that's cool. That's on the right track. John just said, like, uh, you know, what type of what were the first type of cases that they put you on? So you okay, yeah, the team, like, yeah, cool. Yeah, so so you know, at at that point you're just you're on the team and uh you go where they tell you to go the first my first mission was in vietnam up in north in sun la province and it was a, a crash site that had been done several times but they were still finding remains and we called the stairmaster i think it was uh 0987 i believe was a ref no on that but you I'm, it was a it was a workout and so that was a great mission <laughs> um it was a great mission working with the Mountain Yards, um, not the Mountain Yards, but the uh, Muon Nung tribe up north um, and the Hmong. And um, no, it was really great. And then, and most of most of it after that was between Laos and Vietnam, uh, up until about '99 when we got into to North Korea, and then I, I kind of took over the the beginning and the logistics of the North Korean operation and stuff. But mostly it was Southeast Asia. Yeah, so what you know more about the whole Chosin Reservoir thing <laughs> than most people, right? Like when it comes to Korea, you know, you know a lot about the Chosin Reservoir and the losses there as well, right, Mike? Yes, I, I th I'm pretty sure I spent more time in North Korea than any other, um, any other serviceman since the Korean War. But I, I would do the logistics. You know, once they worked out how many missions we could do in North Korea that year and and how much money we would give them and what the time frame was, you typically have three to five missions. And so I'd go into China and South Korea and um, and just procure all the equipment, fly it in to Pyongyang. Um, we had, we'd had we always have a base camp in Unsan down south towards the border. And then we'd have a base camp up in Chosen Reservoir. And so I started in Unsan and then the last four missions I did was up in Chosen Reservoir. And it was um, a total of seven and a half months in country. But it's... Uh, they stopped in 2005 for various reasons we yep. won't get into right now <laughs> but um yeah. yeah 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 it was kind of interesting but it's a twilight zone north korea is a twilight zone no matter what you do i mean if you get to, like me to travel from from you know the south of the country all the way up to the chinese border by vehicle and and live with the north korean army you know for months on end it's uh it's really something that you really can't explain drink with them you mean <laughs> yeah and 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 not on top of that recover dozens and dozens and dozens of, of americans i mean just yes sir it, blow, it blows everything else out of the water as far as how many 
how many identifications you can get out of that. It's just, um, but the politics, you know, it is the politics. That's a problem. Um, do you, you, you've had some similar hurdles in the work in Laos as well, right, Mike? Did you say there's some political hurdles with the work that you've done in the years over the years in Laos? Uh, they're not, not so much as far as with JPAC or Silhai or DPA, they, ha they have a good working relationship with, with Laos and they have good access to the country. Um, the only issues I had with Laos were, were in the last couple of years, um, trying to, to express upon DPA, um, that we could, we could go and finish Pupati, uh, with, with the best, um, and latest technologies. Uh, for a fraction of the cost that they could do it and and we we gave them a proposal they decided not to do it but i yeah i ended up in 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 uh in um uh, i can't think of the name of the town but it's the closest to pupati um and yeah. i just just happened to be you know last year that jpac was in town or dpa was in town <laughs> so it caused quite a stir yeah and so so that didn't go over very well can you explain the Pupati loss? So, like what? Yeah. P P Pupati yeah. was a, is a, is a, I mean, it's a mountain. It's a poo. Um, yeah. And it's, it's got about a 3000, 4,000 foot straight sheer drop on it. And the, the CIA realized that it was the perfect spot, uh, almost impregnable to put um, a radar station to guide the B-52s into North Vietnam for the, for the bombing mission. And so they did, and and they take they taken um, Air Force communication specialists and and radar specialists and mostly enlisted, and they they sheep dipped them, so they they pulled them out of the uh, the Air Force and put them in the CIA, with the guarantee that when they came back they'd be you know have a, have a big promotion and all that type of stuff. But they ended up getting probed pretty quick and overrun by the NBA, and so they had thrown most of the bodies off the cliff and at 3000 feet, you know, the, the search has gone as far as it can with the cliff and the, and the top and the bottom. But if you're going to get IDs, it's going to be on the cliff side. And so, you know, with, with LIDAR and, and other types of newer technology than LIDAR and with, um, and with drones and recovery drones, Remote sensing, yeah. and specialized cameras, I, you know, we could have got the ID done. Um, so I gave them a proposal and and they said, OK, work with the University of Chicago, to Illinois. And um, and I did. And I told them, hey, I'm going up there doing a recon. And next thing you know, you know, it all kind of fell apart because because it was a bad time. And and and, J and DPA was worried about the relations with the Lao. But um, but the fact is, we could have got it done. It would have been done by now. The whole thing, the site would have been closed. But. They keep dragging it on. It, yeah, I'd say we have a similar um, John Bear. Yeah, John Bear, we have a similar situation. Michael and I have a similar situation with the um, the lost location of Jerry Shriver and Maymort. We know yeah. that with the technologies that we use and our we know our abilities, our, our capabilities, and we knew that we could we could easily clear that within two or three days if we can get get um this Michael's. Um, GPR there out there on the on the ground there, so you know it's it's a similar it's a similar thing. You get right up to the line to the wire, but yeah. It's and we gave thing. CPA proposals for all these sites. We gave them proposals so, yeah. for, to clear up just, every MIA loss in Cambodia, and Pupati and several other sites, and also gave them a proposal to to contract out to go into North Korea. And and you're talking about with with seasoned professional anthropologists and mortuary affairs guys and EOD techs and medics and everything else that, that have already been to North Korea and gave them a proposal. The answer was you're not allowed to speak with the North Koreans. So is this a common theme theme with the DPAA on? Yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're so controlling, you know, they, they don't, they can't get outside the box and, and honestly, you know, if, if somebody's going to show you how to do it cheaper, better, and faster, you don't want you don't want that to go public. So, so it's easier just to squash them and shut them down than to let them do um, some proofs of concept. And we, and we gave them and Dave and I gave them Dave and I gave them plenty of proofs of concepts, and they were proven. However, 
Right. You know, it, it's it's the hierarchy. I'm not, and I'm not I'm not bad mouthing the mission at all. I will never. I've, I've done it for years. Yeah. I spent most yes, of my sir. life doing. It, I still do it. Or the, the or mission. the team members that go out and do it. However, yes, when you get to the political political side of it and the hierarchy, yeah, that that you, a, a a clean broom sweep clean, right? A new broom sweep sweep clean. Get rid of them and start over. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, seem I think like the like organization did much good, though. No. Well, let's say it's a well. I think I think it, it just comes down to big bureaucracies. It's always difficult. There's always many a lot of moving parts, but it's similar um, similar issues that we have. I, you know, it's, it comes down to the lines of communication when the lines of communication end on particular issues, and um, when it comes to the recovery of the Japanese individual that um, our team found back in 2010 we've been experiencing something similar to that haven't we mike trying to get people to test find family ref reference samples and test yeah would you say that's fair yeah, yeah very fair yeah exactly um yeah, you know so, when, you, when you get the political side of it it, yeah. it 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 impedes the whole thing um uh, we dave and i were were able to get around to to the chagrin of of some some of the the hierarchy to get to the family members to get the familial dna samples and one of them was koki shiyama and so so that that's a long story that that david already gotten into but that but that's a that's an interesting story too but it's going to take more than the two hours we got to do it yeah and i mean probably the story about them getting that, that frs in japan we can't talk about that either but that's probably a fascinating story too but yeah the end of the line is we we went as far as we could and michael secured that um, family reference sample from the ishiyama family and then we found out from the lab approximately like two a month later that um it was an that the they, they did the comparison between koki ishiyama's sample and the remains that i handed over to them and that they said that it wasn't a match so that's how now we've landed on the taizo ishinose um thing and you know that's what i'm trying to do essentially from doing this podcast series i know that um from the metrics that john has that uh, there's a lot of people in the u.s government that are listen that listen to this podcast when we're yes. doing it so you know i just want everybody to know that we're as we said we're not hostile nobody here is hostile towards a mission in any way or anybody so this we're just we're, we're just talking about these things in um in a way that we're not divulging any classified information but we're talking about something that's very important and it's very important to michael and i that the remains of this person this japanese individual are identified and that person is repatriated and this and this is the way any recovery investigation recovery research investigation on the ground investigation and a recovery operation go you 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 dwindle it down if you don't find it which you don't the 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 absence of, of findings is findings in itself right so yeah right so you you dwindle it down until you get to the point where Dave is at and he's got to dwindle down to where there's Taizo Ishinachi and it couldn't be anybody else. And that, and that came from all, all of the, the DNA from the Flynn um, case and the DNA, the Hapalong groups and the DNA from the Koki Ishiyama's family. And, and down to where we are now, it's a process of elimination and we've reached the bottom of it. And it's pretty simple, um, but there's no assistance from the government to get to the family. And, and that's the problem. Yeah. Well, one, you have one thing to have I have another ask, FRS. Yeah, the one thing I keep asking through this whole thing is, is where's the Japanese government in all this? Well, and that's that's right. Therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. Mm -hmm. You try to do the right thing and and wait them out and ask them to go and and use their political powers to do it, but they don't. It's just it's the same as North Korea. You know, I got denied to go to North Korea to talk to the North Koreans about doing recoveries period as an american citizen i got a denial from the state department but when i went to joseph yoon and i told him i got the denial and they said it wasn't in the best interest of the u.s government for me to go and talk to them about doing private recoveries joseph yoon said if you can get them to agree to a meeting in pyongyang i will facilitate your travel and so joseph yoon outweighs dpa and the state department the people that at least that i talked to 
And so, so that's the point where we're at. But the problem is you don't want to usurp them. Like we don't want to, you know, like Dave was talking about, we don't want to go around it. We want them to go and do it. Just like go talk to yeah. the Ichinashi family and get a DNA reference sample, a family reference sample. Let us go and talk but to they, North Koreans. Yeah, the families right, exactly. are dying and you're doing nothing. When I am, I will go do it for nothing. Just let me go and do it. But you get stopped yeah, every single time you try to do something right and timely. And so that's what yeah. gets so frustrating. Well, that's that's kind of why I do what I do. You know, it's I don't even work with the government. Well, I try to work with them as much as I possibly can. But I go straight to the families, of, you know, to get the DNA. So yeah, have yeah. To provide it. yeah, what you do is amazing, John. <laughs> That's, so, yeah. you know, it's just that from my side, I, you know, I just don't want, I want them to do it. I want to, you know, make oh, a request yeah. and it makes sense yeah. and they just do it, but it just never seemed to happen. So, so I think pretty quickly there's, there's going to be another option to go and, and make some more attempts at doing the things that we just need to do regardless of, of whether or not they like it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, it's like the policy, the policy, John Bear with um, Stony Beach, like when Michael and I have been speaking uh, with the people that we've worked with there, they said that um, when they're out on a mission, if they're out on a mission and they there's bones, they find bones, like unexpectedly find bones. The policy is not to pick the bones up, but then they the caveat is like within the 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 actual agency if you don't if you go out there and there's bones there and you don't pick it up you're a stupid motherfucker and you're gonna lose your job type of thing you're like you're you're done right so like it, it's kind of like officially as michael taught me when michael first started training me he said to me um what is it it's better to apologize later than to ask for permission first and that's kind yeah. of like the, for exactly. a long time that was the way i had to do things over there to get it to like from operational level so yeah, from an operational level that works, but then when it gets to a bureaucratic level, then that can break down, right? Because it's all about communication, and then it becomes about personalities and um, and like a culture, cultural type of things within the military. And Mike and a lot of these guys, they've been around for a long time. But the thing is, is now the thing that I'm feeling um, optimistic about Michael is that there's a lot of new faces and a lot of young people that are coming in now like a new generation of people and you know I don't know whether or not those type of guys can look into these type of things because you know the the analysts don't have um, you know the, the, well, problem I mean, I see, the problem you, you, I see with that bro, is it's the same beer it's the same policies tie in the hands of the same people yeah, it's the same. And and then when you go outside of it and you think you're going to somebody that, that supports you and is going to be an advocate for you, like Ann Mills Griffith, and, but no, they don't. They fall in the same boat. They do. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had well, long, yeah. long, long conversations with Ann Mills Griffith. Long. And and I think that the, the families of the Pupati uh, missing should start hammering the hell out of out of DPA and the, the league of and Mills, and Mills gets her hands tied too by the, the operational um side of the mission that she's involved in with the Stony Beach stuff as well and then the family thing. So you know people the the same people that do great things for um the MIA POW families they they get in their head they get their hands tied in the same way. I see that but um this issue and I'll say thing, you know, there's been a lot of light put on this, on this recovery thing. And, you know, Michael, um, the reason why John and I started to do this series was that there was this like hit piece video put up about us on, um, and about that, that mission in Cambodia on, um, on the, on YouTube by some like anonymous source with, yeah. So, um, so do you, do you want to talk any, anything about, the the back i know we can't go into specifics about about the kind of issues that we've had trying to get this recovery uh, the work that you and i done you and i did together like we we've we've had a lot of hurdles right and along the way oh yeah yeah you know it was a dave dave is the best investigator you're ever going to find i mean outside of inside of government outside of government um a little unorthodox, but that's the way you have to be. And so, so 
Dave came up with with enough evidence to convince me. And and at, at one point in 2009, I was a Cambodia desk officer for JPEG. And so that's how we we ended up um, linking up with with Rory Flynn and um, and him and Mike Loring and trying to help the family. And so and so we did. And and um, the. So we started talking about, OK, how are we going to do the recovery? So I, tr I started training Dave about what I know. And, I'm I, you know, we always have archaeologists, anthropologists with us. But you have two things. You, ha you have a, a form of recovery in the field and then you have mortuary affairs. And so mortuary affairs just doesn't do MIA search recoveries. We, we go out and combat anywhere in the world. And I, I've recovered remains from every type of military aircraft you can imagine off the battlefield from from everywhere. And so there's a, a certain way you go about it, a certain methodology. And so that's what Dave and I were working on. And, and the plan was for me to go in with him to do the recovery. And his dad got the excavator. Everything was set. They paid off the locals, had the security. Um, but just before the operation, uh, there was an earthquake in Haiti. This was 2010. And so I worked for the Department of the Army and one of my, I was the main um, international mass fatality specialist for the Army. So the Army got asked to help the State Department in Haiti find all the American citizens um, that were missing from the earthquake. So I ended up over there. Dave already had everything set. So, you know, hey, what are you going to do? Dave went and he did a great job. Excellent job. Mechanical excavation. He turned the remains over, um, but before he turned the remains over to the embassy, you know, he would send me pictures and then we'd go get x-rays and I'm in Haiti. But the good thing is I'm at a DMOR, a disaster mortuary, mortuary response team facility that we had all the forensic we ever needed to, to do identification. So so Dave would go in Phnom Penh and get an x-ray of, of the mandible and and photos and this and that, and he'd send them to me. So I'd, I'd bring in our forensic odontologist and say, hey, I'm not going to tell you anything about this, but what do you, what do you see? What do you see? And their answers were late 50s, early 60s, probably Eastern European dental, um, but it was used sometimes in Asia, other places. So that information went back to, to Dave and and it's exactly correct. So when you look at the the, the, the dental work on the mandible, it's it's not something you're going to find in the Cambodian. And so so process of elimination and it's brought it to Japan. See yeah. what he does the great overlays of Ganache's jaw. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can yeah, you yeah. Hear me? It just I think the internet just went a little bit weird again. Okay, sorry. So, can you yeah, you said about the overlays of the Ichinose jaw. Yeah. 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 So 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 they do these great overlays of, of the live um Ichinose and and the mandible and the dimple and the dimple on his chin. And you know, and his history, it I mean, it couldn't be anybody else. And so, so and the only the only thing since, since there's true. yeah, since there's no dental records that we can we can get, the only way you're going to solve this is to go to the family and get a familial sample and run a DNA match. We they DPA's already got the DNA. So all you need work. is a familial sample. It's a FedEx it package. Doesn't, doesn't the family yeah. already think they've already recovered him? Yeah, yeah. So so that's who they have. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that it could be anybody else than Taizo Ishinashi. And, yeah. um, and it's it's really funny when I look at those emails from Haiti when I'm sending you those pictures and we're going backwards and forwards and then Mike sent it to me and we were like, because, you know, I was looking for Sean Flynn, looking for an American guy. And then Mike came back to me with that stuff about the dental and I said, hey, Mike, I hope we haven't found Mr. Wu here. And he said, there's a good chance you would, you know, man, we could have found Mr. Wu, but Mr. Wu's name is, is Ishinose, but... Yeah, I thought maybe we found a, an Asian guy here, but the, the, that DNA um, haplogroup, haplotype M25, it traces to Korean people and Japanese people that have um, they come from the Raikuku chain islands like um, 
Kaiyushu, like the same place where Ishinose comes from. So that's a very rare um, haplogroup. That's an indigenous um, Japanese people that right. they're mixed so, kind so of you, like Caucasoid. Yeah. Yeah. So you have, um, when you look at the haplogroup, there's about a 23% chance that it could be Cambodia. There's a 77% yeah. chance that it's either from Korea or Japan. And so that's the way that it, that the study goes. It breaks it down. So, so what I had done was gone to, to DPA, to the lab manager, and said, look, you've got this new isotope testing machine. And this thing's great. They spent $10 million on it. Exactly. And what it does, you put a sample, you put a sample of the bone in it, and it, it breaks it down into, into um, minerals from your first 10 or 12 years of life. And, and they've done so many studies around the globe that they can kind of pinpoint. So say you, you have four remains and one's from Milwaukee. And you do DNA analysis on, or this isotope analysis on all four of them. One of them is going to come back and say, here's a circle search of about 10 miles where this person grew up because of the water that they drank and the air that they breathed. Yeah. So I went to DPA and I said, well, why don't you just take these with your new machine and do the isotope study? And I bet you it tells you it's from the part of Japan where, where Taizo Ishinashi is from. But they won't do it. It's not going to hurt anyone either as well, it's Mark, like trying anybody. to do something. Yeah, it's not going to hurt. It's not going to hurt the reputation of anybody for them to do this. It's, there's no. There's absolutely. There's absolutely no reason for the, for people not to, for the for the organization not to look into this, and for anybody who can help to to not help us try to you know to help us try to get this thing done with Ty, like this ID done with Tizo. It's been now almost eleven. 11 years so oh well yeah it's been 11 years so 10 years 11 years so so mike where's the pushback is it the policy dpa's policy that because he's not an american citizen that they're not going to look at it any further i think so i i think that's mostly um it, and it's it's similar to sean flynn you know that it's not their priority he wasn't military dana right. stone wasn't military they get a lot of the stuff that comes in and, and, and some of the stuff is, is more recent. They do current, current death type of stuff. You know, you get bones from the desert. Oh, it may yeah. be a French journalist. That's kind of getting, it's going to get shelved a little bit unless you get some political pressure behind it. And that's where I was saying exactly. about the, the league of families and animals Griffin, they could do a lot more than they're doing. You know, she's going to retire, which is fine. I think it's good. I think it's time. They recovered ID her brother, time for her to go bring some new blood in and let's get this thing going. There's need to be some pressure and uh, it's just not happening. But the pushback, yeah, is, is politics. It's just politics. And, and the state department really needs to become more involved in DPA's um, shelf cases of non-military because if they're non-military, then it's a state department issue. Either they're an American who died overseas was a state department issue or they're in a foreigner that we have their body, which is a State Department issue. And right. it's so, only really, it's from Mike pushing, really. Mike, Mike's a bit of a bulldog, I'm sorry to say, but when it comes down to these type of things, he doesn't, with me, I, I back I back off a little bit sometimes because I'm an Australian guy and I'm, you know, Mike is a person that introduced me into this world. It's his world and everybody knows him. And when people give, Mike, Mike pushing hard on this as being a bulldog is what got us to the Ishinose thing because if Mike hadn't have pushed as hard as he had to get the Ishiyama thing, the FRS and for the Ishiyama thing to happen and Mike pushed so hard, he pissed off so many people to be able to get that done and he got that done. And, um, you know, maybe that that's the thing too. Like this was said, it, I, I'm hoping that the it comes down to some new blood coming in or people that, you know, that may have had disagreements with us before can be a little bit compassionate and empathetic about the the whole issue not say thing because um you know we we've had to fight tooth and nail and the thing that we're fighting for is it's a it's not like it's not a noble cause we're fighting to identify somebody and return them to their country of origin and um you know when it comes to the repatriation of um expat people that have went missing overseas you know um mike 
as he can assert when he's been in battlefields or in places like Haiti, you can't choose who you who you um, respond to, who you find. It's just, you know, the mission guides you to where you have to be and you can't decide on the parameters of the mission, on you know, the realities of what's going to happen when you get there, you know? Yeah. So. Yep. So uh, what's going on with the Initiate? I can't even say his name half the time, but with, with his family, has anybody, you you know, have you heard anything? You not say yeah, Nishinose. <laughs> I can't Ishinose, say that. Yeah, Kaiser Ishinose. So Ishinose, um, right before COVID, Ishinose was Ishinose's family and the Nikon camera company did um, an exhibition of Taizo Ishinose's work. So his family is still active in putting his photographic work out there. Um, I have been unable to make contact with them. We've had some people trying to make contact, but you know, the, it's always much easier if you have some type of assistance on the government side to secure that FRS. But as Mike said, it's just a matter of sending um, sending something out in the post, the FedEx package. So hopefully, we can through the, this process of talking about this that we can, you know, start to. I don't know. I don't know what our chances are. Maybe I'm too optimistic. I should be more realistic, but. Um, you know, it just, it can't be too difficult, Michael, for the process that happened last time to happen again, which is that process of just getting an FRS from Japan and then taking, sending it to Seal High and getting it checked. Yeah. I mean, that's all, that's all it's going to take. And, and I think at this point, at this point, it would be better for an outside person to go and find that family, get the FRS and give it to DPA and get the the Japanese embassy involved in DC. Okay. Okay, the Japanese embassy in DC. Um Mike, what what um what do you want to say about the type of operations that we're working on in Cambodia and about Cambodia? Yeah, so there I mean the what the way I mean Dave and I go way back with Vietnam stuff and everything else. But the more recent stuff in Cambodia came up as, as uh, I, w- I was living in Thailand and, um, and was asked to come over and, and just um, help out a little bit. So there, were, there was a period of time where Hun Sen closed down Cambodia MIA operations for a year. And it was a spat over a repatriation of criminal Cambodians from the U.S. And so the U.S. still needed to go and, and try to get some information, but, but of course, they were shut down on doing it. And that's what I, I was there doing it as a hobby anyway. So it just made more sense to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm here anyway. You know, I'm doing it as a hobby. I can give you whatever information that I find. Um, and then Dave, Dave came in, helped out on that. And, uh, and then... Everything, you know, since the government shut down all the MIA stuff, um, we ended up with uh, with the uh, DC Cam, which is a document center of Cambodia, Cambodia, and they were in charge of the, the war crimes and with the Khmer Rouge and the prosecutions of the surviving Khmer Rouge leadership. And so they were documenting as much as they can from the killing fields and what happened um, in order to finish those prosecutions, but then those prosecutions kind of went away. But the Cambodian government still wanted to to find um, the locations of these killing fields, exact locations. So there's 388 killing fields around Cambodia. You know, people hear the killing fields, they think about like one area or maybe Tolstoy yeah. prison or something like that. There's 380 different places they whack people, and a lot of them. And so what the what the Cambodian government wanted to do was to go in and and monumentize, memorialize the victims um, at the right location where the graves were. And most of them were at schools, um, temples, and areas like that. Uh, so so we had the ground pene- penetrating radar, and Dave and I went out and um, we worked with DC Cam and we mapped a, um, a, a location in in Prevang. Cambodia, down towards the Vietnamese border, 
and we located seven graves and, and we could give them a, we can give them a great, you know, uh, description of, of how long the graves and how wide the graves and how deep the graves were. And based on the, the Vietnamese recovery out of Tol Soi, um, prison 21 in Phnom Penh, how many, how many bodies were in the graves and how big the graves were and how deep they were. We, we could pretty much calculate how many bodies were in there. And you could actually see with the GPR um, voids, and that's what the GPR picks up. And you could pretty much pick up the skull, and then you pick up a layer of dirt, and you pick up more skulls and voids. And so you could see what they did. They came in and they dug the grave, and they bring people in, they whack them, and then they just throw some dirt on top. So, you know, they're going to decompose but they're not going to fill in the hole because it's still a good grave. And then later they bring more people and whack them. So you could actually see that on the GPR. And so, so we mapped it out for them. And, um, and it I mean, it was a great thing to do. We gave them a great report on it and, and an approximate number of people that were, were probably um, killed there. And, and they built the monumentation and, you know, and they're still working on that. So it's, I think it's a great project. I was glad, you know, to help out with Dave on that. Yeah, and that that's an important distinction that Mike made before too that hasn't been said before that during the time that all the operations were closed down that there was people that were helping out the United States that were from uh, say countries like Australia and uh, when nobody else was doing it and Michael and I were the very few people that were over there doing operations at the time that everything was shut down. So for us to be looking for MIAs, it was fucking... If we got caught by the wrong people for even us having the right people on our side over there for looking for MIAs at that time, it was it was technically they the the guys that um, were upset about that they could have um, really started a lot of trouble for us. They could have said that it was espionage or something like that for us being over there because the president had specifically said that they that wasn't supposed to happen. But you know, Mike and I were looking into cases like Alan Hirons and Terry Reynolds. Alan Hirons is an Australian citizen. Terry Reynolds is an American citizen, and they were both civilians. So the reality is, is you, we had the military military cases we were looking into, the civilian cases, and then also the work that we were doing with DC Cam and Mr. Yuk Chang. I got to say, he's helped me so much over the years with documentation. And um, the year actually, when Michael and I were working with him, he just won the recently won the Ramon Magsaysay say, Human Rights Medal, which is a Nobel Peace Prize for human rights in Asia. And Mike and I were working with him at that time. And so, yeah, we're very proud of that work. Um, we made it on Radio Free Asia. We all, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, Yu Chan, Yu Chan is a, he's a great man. I mean, he's got a great story. If you ever get a chance to read about his life and um, what happened to him and his family, uh, during the Khmer Rouge, he, he really took this on as a, as his life mission to try to bring these people to justice. And now, I think he now his life's mission, yeah, it's, 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 it's to not forget and make sure nobody forgets. Yeah. 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 He's, he's, um, the, the work that he's done, like, as you said, I think he's now he's been, um, DC Cam have started memorial, doing more of those memorials around Cambodia from what I've heard, Michael. And uh, uh, yeah. so John Bear, the whole idea is is um, what, what we were doing is we were delineating um, public places where executions had happened before because there's kids going to school and there's particular areas where, where the soccer field, where the kids were playing soccer, there was many people murdered there and people float up and stuff so and remains drift up to the top so what we were doing is the whole concept that we're doing with dc cam is we de delineate these public locations and then what yuk chang does then is he takes the local people and he builds like these buddhist burial stupas and they paint them in these like really modern colors and everything it's really it looks really beautiful the whole idea is to delineate where all of these crimes happen and to put these beautiful like buddhist stupas with the modern um modern art kind of colors and the people in the communities are the people who create it but there's also like a whole bunch of money that he's bringing in from other countries to create these centers and stuff but he's doing some really meaningful things and you know there's no chance of um any further pursuit of human uh, um, human rights crimes with the tribunal and the Khmer Rouge guys so yeah I'll, I'll tell you a funny story I, I want to tell you a funny story because we Dave and I were down in 
Praveng and and um, we were surveying the site and we got in a big delay because I forgot what it was, but Dave's like, I'm going to, that field over there across the street, it looks like it's a, uh, we, we need to survey that. And I was like, I ain't going over there, man. That's not to me. Uh, I'm stuck right here. I'm focused on this, this site that we got, but we, but we were stuck, you know, there's nothing you could do. So Dave takes the DPR over there and he goes, Thompson through ankle deep mucky water and and diapers floating in it and everything else and then oh. he comes back didn't find of course didn't find anything out there but we get back to Phnom Penh next thing you know Dave's got foot and mouth disease he's all <laughs> messed up for months and months because yeah, of being out there and that thing. <laughs> I don't yeah, know if you want me to tell, I don't know if you want me to tell your 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 personal um your personal that's medical. okay Angel is crazy brave. <laughs> this is a problem. He's crazy brave. And I met this dude when I was like 23 or so, 24 or something like that. So I've been following in his footsteps since then. And when there's a problem, like when, what he's talking about, there we had to clear an area and there's a tree there. And I'm like, I'll cut that tree down or whatever. I'll go through it and boom, I knock it down and the tree falls down and it, it, there's a big prong in it and it sticks into my back. This is at the same time that I've stepped in the diaper water. <laughs> and like, I mean, it's not American diaper water. This is Cambodian diaper water out in Prey Vang and stuff. Like, you know, the the there's no not really any running toilets or anything like that out there. So apart from so everybody just dumps everything there. And yeah, I stepped in that groundwater. And as soon as I took my boots off, there were these two big white like um marks on the bottom of my feet and i was like well this isn't good whatever it is so yeah i got something similar it was foot hand and mouth disease but the way that i caught it and the intensity of it because i put my feet right in there it was kind of like golf war that golf war syndrome thing or whatever it made me super sick for ages but yeah it was fun it's all it's all fun. yeah you know yeah, stories like that <laughs> yeah we got stories about malaria and dinghy and whatever else you can think of yeah and stories about in cambodia and um cambodia and north korea and mataharis probably as well michael as well but we're not going to get into that and vietnamese and <laughs> <laughs> sparrow hawk global guys yeah cool man so um um yeah mike um uh john bear do you have any questions that you want to ask mike yeah, just yeah, just kind of cool. keep going with some of the case or some of the the, the things that you've been on. I mean, uh, uh, so you've you've taken part on both uh, int intel gathering and also the recovery. Is that correct? I, I I've been on I've been on investigation teams, but that's not that's not that's a more in a leadership role. I have no background in investigation, and I'm terrible at it. I'm good I'm good at leading the teams, but 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 I prefer the recovery side of it and the operational yeah. side, logistics side. But, but yeah, yeah pretty, pretty much Dave, Dave, Dave is the expert on this Intel stuff. Cause I can't do what he does. Well, all. I'm sure, I'm sure you got some stories about Russian helicopters, don't you? Uh, I do. I got a lot of stories about Russian helicopters. Um, um, some Mike, good, some um, bad. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I don't, I don't, I maybe, um, can you talk about the the situation that happened with uh was it the the debt number two or the team that went that had the crash and yeah. when you, yeah. you, were, you were, yeah yeah um so i was the uh, the logistics nco so so back then you had jpac and you had jtffa still so before you had so high and jtffa JTFFA Joint Task Force Full County. They were up the hill at Camp Smith, and they focused by charter, government charter, on strictly Vietnam War losses. And then you had the Sil High, which we had recovery teams, and we had um, we had all the linguists and, and all that stuff. Well, JTFFA had the linguists, but we had everything else. So, so they would augment us going on mission. Uh, so you get the linguists and you get any intel analysts and stuff that came out of Joint Task Force Full Accounting. Um, but uh, but that's kind of kind of the way it started. Um, 
and then we, you know, you, you end up going into Vietnam on the mission. You get assigned a mission. You go do the recovery mission, and then you bring the remains back, and they end up at the seal. But uh, I think I missed your question, Dave. The helicopter. Oh, the helicopter, Chris. Yeah, I was trying to avoid that. That's why. Yeah. I'm but anyway, sorry. So, so now we um, I ended up working with JTFFA at the debt, uh, you know, for seven months as a logistics and CEO. So I had Colonel Corey there, who was my boss, Rennie Corey. Uh, Green Bray Special Forces Colonel. He was a detachment commander, and I had um, Colonel Mar- uh, Major Martin, Air Force. He was XO, and uh, and Marty Flynn and Pete. So every, everybody that was there. So we, all of us lived together at the compound, and we would go do investigations and do. I do logistics in between the missions. I do logistics while the teams were in, and I ended up. At, Colonel Corey got me extended there, and then. North Korea operation came up and they said, you know, uh, nobody else could go and do the logistics for North Korea. So that was going to kick off in early April. So this was March when we got the word. So you had to get kind of just leave and go to China and, and South Korea and get all the stuff ready. But Colonel Corey's like, hey, you know, I can get you to stay. And I, uh, yeah, I'd love to stay, you know, but I've got I've got nobody else can do North Korea. So I left. And then a couple of weeks later, they were doing a investigation up in the central island and crashed. They were all killed. I was in actually in Seoul at the time and then ended up in the base camp in North Korea for 66 days. So it was kind of rough, you know, when everybody you lived with got killed, but yeah, not much you can do, but I, 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 I'm still in touch with all the families and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think we just passed that anniversary here not too long ago, didn't we? Yeah, April 7th, 2001. Yeah. Yeah, so um Yeah, and- so that that was a bit, that was a big a big deal, you know, for the community there and and actually I think that had a lot to do with JPAC had just been organized and yeah. I think it had a lot to do with pulling in JTFFA and 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 JPAC into DPA and getting rid of the two different groups. Right. Um, yeah. No so Two yeah, people doing the same thing. Um, yeah, and from a political point of view too, I think that changed the relationship between Vietnam and the U.S. It made it more, it made it closer as well because of, there was many Vietnamese um, military yeah. personnel and U.S. personnel that perished together in the yeah. same. Yeah, there same were there were nine Vietnamese and seven American, and the only one I didn't know out of all the Vietnamese and, and Americans was the new incoming commander, Colonel Martin. So Colonel Corey was leaving, I think it was going back to Fort Bragg or the Pentagon or somewhere, and Colonel Martin was coming in. So they both got killed. So the outgoing commander and the incoming commander both got killed. Oh. And then, um, uh, but it did, when you had nine Vietnamese and you had Colonel Bien, which was, he was actually a general, but he couldn't do the mission as a general. So he got paid as a general, but and he was a general, but they'd always call him Colonel because he wanted to keep doing the mission with us, and he couldn't do it as a general. But um, he ended up getting killed there. It's a great guy. Dedicated yeah. people. And um, so every anniversary, they go up to the to the crash site, and there's a monument up there in Vietnamese and English. And so yeah. it did bring, it did a lot to to bring them together. But I mean, at that time, we were the relations were really good anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, and that's the thing. U.S. and Vietnamese relations are very warm, and not a lot of people know that. But they, America yeah. and no, the, Vietnam the, have great the cooperation. Vietnamese, yeah, the VNO S and P, the Vietnamese Office Sinking Missing Person, and and the USMIA Office Detachment Two in Hanoi, and it's the same in Laos. There has never been any big issues. You know, they work. These guys go and live with us in the jungle. I went over to uh, to Vietnam in 2019 at the request of the Vietnamese, Be- and and I don't know if I told you this, Dave, but yeah. um, I I get a call from or an email from a Vietnamese guy. It says I'm I'm Vietnamese. I live in Phnom Penh. Okay. But I'm very interested. I, I read about I heard about what you're doing with the GPR, and I would like to come work with you for free. Cool. So I can learn. And so I, I, 
you know, and I talked to Mike about it. I was like, man, this don't sound right. And Mike's like, yeah, no, fuck that motherfucker. It don't sound right. You know, you know how Mike is. And I was like, all right. So I, I blew him off. And the next thing you know, I get a call from a Vietnamese colonel in, <laughs> in Saigon saying, hey, can you come to, to Saigon and have a meeting with us about about um, helping us recover our missing? I said, yeah, I'll come over. So I go over there and, and we have a meeting at this hotel and and we start talking about the GPR and they're they're asking me like really pointed questions about what about rocks? Will that mess it up? What about groundwater? What about roots? And I'm I'm thinking these guys know more than they're saying, you know, about GPR stuff. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. But if you know how if you know what you're looking for, you can differentiate. And and finally they came out and said, okay, so here's the deal. We bought we paid seventy five thousand dollars for this Italian GPR. And <laughs> And the American said that there was a, there was a mass grave out at the end of the runway, and we went out there with the GPR and our guys, and so they gave it to the Saigon detachment of the People's Republic, or the yeah, people, the Pavan, and yeah. they um, couldn't work it out, and they couldn't find it, and yeah. and so the colonel that was in charge of this, and you might yeah. know him, but he's like, I believe the Americans that they buried it here, and but you can't find it. <laughs> So he brought out a bunch of extra and they just tore the whole thing up and then they found it. And so, yeah. so the Vietnamese army was, had a black eye and they're like, well, well, I think because we couldn't see it because there's rocks and there's roots and there's water. And so they're asking me and I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, you bad mouth yeah. their guys. I said, just look, I'll just, I'll come over and train your guy. I'll either come out and do it. I'll bring my people in. I was going to bring you in there. Yeah. And we'll, we'll go and we'll do the, the sites for you or, or you and I will will come in there and train them, and you know because they got a seventy five thousand dollar DPR, so That's it's not hard for us to go and train them. Yeah. And then as soon as that was over, this was November of twenty nineteen. Yeah. COVID. 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 Yeah. And so so it's still there. We can still go and do it. We still have um, the connections too. So yeah. yeah, I still got yeah, I definitely got the connections. So and. Uh, so we yeah, should. That's, that's interesting. Like maybe maybe they didn't have the they weren't using Echo Echo Soft. They just didn't um, know what they were doing. They didn't have they yeah, had the they, software. They didn't have the software. Yeah, they didn't have and, the software. They didn't have the post the the post. But software. but it was it would have been an easy training mission analysis. for us to go and do it. Yeah, and there's plenty of there's plenty of missions. Like for example, there's one guy I know. He lives up in Oregon, and he was he was a serviceman during the war, and there was a battle, and he sent me all the details. And um, the his his unit used a bulldozer to dig a big hole, and they dropped about thirty NVA in there. And I have the exact coordinates for that location. And uh, mm -hmm. the Vietnamese want to know exactly where it is out there. But yeah, sometimes it seems that um, <laughs> the best option is to use the excavator to try to work out what's going on, because it seems like in Vietnam now, in the modern day, mm -hmm. it's not like in the old days when you first arrived where you could like find a combat boot sticking out of the ground. Most of the remains that are unearthed now are unearthed through some like redevelopment or construction accidentally or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Development, yeah. So John Bear, do you have any questions, sir? Yeah, well, one one of the things that kind of piqued my interest, you were talking about working in, working in North North Korea. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, some of my listeners they have loved ones that were still MIA from North Korea and the Korean War, I should say. Uh, what was it like working with the the North Koreans trying to make recoveries? Um, I mean, did you have was like their little reminders that were following you around and and. Tell us a little more about yeah, that. Yeah, no, it's more. No, it's more than that. I mean, if you go, if you go to Burma, or Lao, or or some place like that, you have miners that follow you around. That's no big deal. But North Korea, it's it's like it's, I mean, you're controlled, controlled. You you can't. You're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere. They don't already approve you to go, and it's going to be it's very very controlled. But I started going there in '98. And they stopped the missions in 95. There were a couple of years we didn't have missions because they couldn't get an agreement because President Clinton said something bad or whatever. <laughs> and so they would they would just wouldn't do it. But um, but I ended up going in at, at on the first mission because the logistics were so hard because they wouldn't let you stay in a hotel um, except sometimes on the weekend. 
um, but you couldn't base camp in a hotel. So you, the logistics about putting up a base camp for 200, actually two base camps, one in Unsan County down near the border and one up in the Chosen Reservoir outside of Chongjin, um, were, were very, very, very difficult because you had to get the equipment and, and you had to look at whether it's your stuff, your plumbing, um, your your electrical, everything is metric or standard. What can you buy in the States? What can what do you have to go to South Korea or China to buy? And then how are you going to get it in? Um, hazard, hazmat, batteries and fuel, propane to get you through, you know, cooking and, and the heat in the tents, especially up in the Chosen Reservoir. Where we got stuck in the snow several times, um, even in the spring so you would just you would go in at the beginning we would fly into pyongyang and c-17 um and then we would have other airplanes bring in our equipment and but it was so sparse that it was it was really living like you pretty much like you would in the korean war at the beginning of the korean war in, in a pup tip at the very beginning and and knowing that i was going to end up coming back all the time i i said you know there's no, the, we're giving the North Koreans a lot of stuff, vehicles and fuel, um, fuel oil and vegetables and everything else and $5 million a year, you know, to let us come in there. You got to throw some money at the teams to make sure that we're, we're taken care of because if you're in there for a month at a time or two months or three months, then, then you've got to have some, at least some facilities to, to be comfortable enough. And a lot of days you couldn't work either because of weather, but normally because it's because the North Koreans just got something up their ass and they wouldn't let you go to work. You know, one day I, I, I one day I bring my team down to work in the Chosen Reservoir and North Korean Colonel says, wow, we're not working today. And I said, why? Now, what is it this time? And he goes, oh, the Japanese. The Japanese must pay us restitution for the 200,000 comfort women they used during World War II. I was like... <laughs> Oh, bitch! If they had to pay, the Japanese had to pay money to everybody that they screwed over in World War II. There'd be no Japan; they'd be broke. He'd be like, yeah, good. "No Japan, very good, very good." <laughs> but uh, as a Twilight Zone, so you you would go and and uh, you meet your counterparts um, in the morning, and you go out to the site, and you'd have a, an investigation team, you'd have a recovery team, and it's not like in in Vietnam or Laos or anywhere else in the world where where you could go from an investigation team and switch over to a recovery team and start recovering. Their right. definition was, you can this team can only do investigations, and this team can only do recoveries. So, <laughs> if there's nothing to recover, the recovery team stays in the damn base camp, which sucks. Yeah. And then when uh -huh. you find something to recover, if the North Koreans say we don't have anything to investigate, the investigation team stuck there. When you could have actually two teams doing recoveries or two teams doing investigation, but it was a translation issue <laughs> and it never got resolved, uh -huh. is that you couldn't have both teams doing the same thing at the same time. And they couldn't they couldn't switch back and forth. But 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 the good thing is that you know we I had really good relations with the North Koreans. Um you know, Colonel Kim, who I see still, you know, when they turned over the remains in Pyongyang um, to Dr. Bird, there he is, you know, he's, and I was like, man, that guy's still there. We haven't been back there in 17 years, but, but he's still there. But I had yeah. great, great, great relation with him. I've got, I've got some, some things that, you know, not many army NCOs can say, you know, here, here's some souvenirs that the North Korean army gave me. But, um, you know, right. little stuff, chopsticks, silver chopsticks, things like that. But but um, but it, it, I think it was going fine. And we recovered so many remains. I mean, we're after, you know, trying to pull teeth out of out of crash sites and um, and doing stuff in the South Pacific. Uh, when you're excavating pretty much mass graves, you know, each one of them has six or 10 or 12 Americans in it. Sometimes they're mixed with South Koreans because. What the North Koreans did in the Chosen Reservoir, they waited until the spring and they sent body recovery teams out and they recovered on ox carts all the bodies and they put the Chinese in one location. Everybody else, they just dump them in foxhole or a bomb crater or drag them out on the ice and wait till the ice, wait till the ice thawed. But, but the, we recovered so many bodies there and they were so intact. I mean, we had to bring in propane refrigerators because they started decomposing. 
and this is from the Korean War. Right. And so, so there are so many there that are so easily easily recoverable that they should just let us somebody go in and recover them. I will go tomorrow and leave. Yeah, Mike's been team. trying to get clearance for a long time to get back in. We've been wanting to. We've been talking about using GPR and uh, lidar technology, remote sensing there in the Chosin Reservoir, in a like a yeah, mass you, scale. You you would you would you would you would never run out. There's three thousand. American bodies strewn across not very large and area and they're all they're all put in the same pockets. And so you can right. go you can walk the potato fields and start looking for buttons and fragments of bone and clothing. And that's how we did it at the beginning. And then you kind of narrow that in and strip off some of the topsoil and then you'd be like, okay, here it is. Here's a feature. Let's dig it. And th there'd be 10 or 12 Americans commingled in there. Wow. And um, it's just not like nothing you're ever going to find anywhere else from any other war in any other location. And they're there and we're just going to wait for their brothers and sisters to all die and not get closure. Right. Because why? Nobody yeah. can answer yeah. that. Yeah. Well, that's it. And uh, yeah, the, the definition of closure. Um, yeah. You know, uh, with this job, but there's there's probably not much not not much closure, and it's very rare that families get to see closure. But you know that's what we're trying to, I suppose the the ethical underlying thing we're trying to bring closure for people. And um, well, that's why that's why we not. don't we don't actively do search and recoveries for civil war or World War One or the Philippines War or any anywhere else because there's nobody to bring closure to. There's nobody that knew that individual is still alive. The only wars you have are World War Two, Korea, and Vietnam. And those are slowly going away. And if you don't focus your resources and your efforts on trying to bring closure to the relatives that are still alive, then what are you doing? Yeah, I agree with that 100%. You know, after working, after working with a lot of the families, it's just, just like one case I worked on here a couple of years ago, World War II case. It was a Cabatatuan there in the Philippines, a POW that uh, was buried there and, and of course those remains were all commingled and everything else so the, the dpa has their 60 percent frs policy that you have to meet before they'll disinter any of those graves well the records are good enough to know who's in each of those mass graves originally were buried in those graves for the most part but they just kept putting more graves and more graves and more graves on top of us on getting the frs and i'm working with uh, the pow the pow's brother uh, and he's now in his early 90s, and he's still waiting for the day that his brother Martin gets to come home. And we've met the the threshold. We ended up having to research over 100, 100 uh, POW families and get an FRS for over 100 families wow. on that one case alone. Wow! You know, and it took me it took me about a year to do it, but I got it. Yeah. Uh, but here we are, another year and a half later, and they're still waiting for Martin to come home. Well, and and there's there's ten thousand of us out there. There's 10,000s of you and me and Dave that need to, to go to them, to go to the government and say, you've got to get outside the box here. It's yeah. all about time. It, it's all about time either. To me, it's, it's closure to the families. But then also time degrades all the remains. Yeah. yeah. The less DNA they'll be able to extract. And the more time yeah. goes by, the less DNA there is. I've been on sites where you have a full skeletal remains, everything's intact, all the personal effects. And I've been on sites where you see the soles of the boot and the belt buckle and the, the helmet, and there ain't nothing in between. And, and then, yeah, then there's cool. one in Cambo, <laughs> like, yeah. boom, like wet season, dry season for 40 years, and it's just going to be like compressed desert, and you're looking for a target that's going to be 1.7 meters down there. We know exactly what it looks like. So Mike and I, with with our team, we could have we could have rolled up, and the first mission was supposed to be jerry shriver's operation out and name what there but we could have rolled up because we had all of those lost locations all very clearly um, laid out to us and we could have rolled that up in in the maybe one or two dry season windows and you know um that's the reality of it you'd probably say that it would be four or five but 
like you know if we had a good run at it we could get we could wrap most of those cases up in a couple of years just getting out there with the gpr because the gpr saves so much time and i can't stress about how useful a tool ground penetrating radar is john like and in the future with um after COVID, i think there's probably going to be more people that are willing to go looking into these cases like family members and stuff that have been locked down that have been even more frustrated by the process so in the future i want to continue to work um with michael and um with ground penetrating radar because i think that it's gonna it's the only thing it's the only tool at this point when you're looking at history being on the wrong side of history like we're talking about with time and environmental factors like gpr is the last chance and um we can we can find it we we pretty much we worked out when we went to Prevang what a cambodian grave looks like the, the remains of a, like a, a, a grave on the gpr of a cambodian person so an american person or anybody else is going to be the same it's just going to be the target's going to be a little bit larger a little bit smaller so right yeah, yeah. I was just talking about gpr mike and how it's a great tool and uh yeah what we've been doing what we've been able to do with it so far we identified um the remains of approximately 100 location of the remains of 188 people on that prey vang mission and i wanted i wanted to just say like um the thing that we we're able to learn there is um to be able to i to show that we've been able to identify something and then also to be able to uh, present the absence of something like we we're able to show you with the gpr data like a field that is empty that it just has like a few tree roots in there and then we're able to show you like a field that is super hot with like maybe 42 graves in that in that of uh, 42 individuals buried in that one mass grave so yeah so, we so can I mean, the difference between something and nothing the, the good thing the good thing about a gpr and, and a lot of I know a DPA in the laboratory on the anthropological side, a lot of them don't agree with it. And it may have changed with the younger group coming in with the, the technology. But as far as when I was working with the anthropologists there on the teams, most of them didn't agree with the use of the DPR because they're traditional archaeologists and anthropologists. So so you, you, you approach it um, as they teach you to in, in school. And it's an archaeological dig and you start from a datum and you work your way out, you know, and and it's slow, methodical process. And you're going off the hypothesis that something is to the northeast of your southwest datum. And so so you start digging and you start stripping off and then you get to a buffer area where you say, OK, we we've, we've, we've got a big enough buffer around where it's not here. Well, if, if he would go in with the GPR. If you're looking for uh, an isolated burial or a crash site, it'll tell you where it's not. It's not yeah. going to tell you where it is, but it'll definitely tell you where it can't be. And and so you don't have to do all that digging and wasting time and money when you could be focusing your efforts on a pinpoint location where there's a feature. Not saying that feature is a grave or, or a crash site, but I can tell you where it's a, a grave or crash site is not. And don't waste your time digging there. And and that's the yeah, whole exactly. thing. If they don't, if they don't, if they don't embrace that, and it can be used everywhere, and, and it's really terrain dependent. But fifty percent, sixty percent of the time, you you can really employ that tool, and it will save you a shitload of time and money and effort, and um, and and it just makes sense, you know. On the spot reconnaissance, multiple uh, GPS, um, you know. It, that relates to multiple GPS coordinates. You plug it into your computer and into the EchoSoft system, and then um, we get all the post data, and it's it just shows you exactly where everything is in um, ten centimeter ten centimeter increments. Shows you like yeah. a photograph of of the 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 area that you've scanned in ten centimeter increments. So it's amazing, yeah. and yeah. it is going to be the future of this type of forensic um because it's you know it's very small footprint and it's effective and it's more effective than just standing on the location because you know if you hit a wall when it comes to investigation on one of these historical cases then like you know in, unless you get an excavator you're not going to be able to 
find out what's underneath there and that's a, the gpr it shows us where it is where where the target is the forensic target. Well, and that's another thing so so mechanical excavation like like dave conducted on the site in 2010 there's absolutely nothing wrong with that i mean when you're when you're dealing with with a intact remains or a very large area or a deep area um there's nothing wrong with doing that you have to do it like he did it and watch as you progress and to stop and check it and then you you move to to hand excavation physical excavation um and so and so there was nothing wrong so all the stuff they put on dave about well you know he he desecrated the site because he used a bulldozer that's called mechanical excavation it's perfectly acceptable anywhere in the world for that type of operation but but you can minimize that by using the gpr and, and dave dave went to school for the gpr in the u.s and then both him and i went to singapore um, to learn how to use the gpr for for isolated burials and which is a very fine skill it's not right. like I mean, yeah. you can use the gpr for finding underground pipes and utilities and all this kind of stuff and marking stuff and being you know ma bell or whatever they they call them nowadays <laughs> you know but 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 it, it it really is to to find burials is a specialized skill and and it, the only way you're going to learn it is to learn the dpr and then actually go out in the field and do it and and if you're not using it like g like dpa isn't effectively using it then then they'll never get the skills to to even solve any cases yeah it has to be like at least a three a three day exhaustive effort like you know how how we how we did it before you would come in and you would use your skills to um set everything up and clear everything and then we'd dry it out and then you know it's, it's only a two or three day operation to say is there anything here well no there's nothing here or well there's something here and it's at this depth and um here is the the data which is you shows you exactly where it is with with multiple channel gps so and then you just take the features so and then you just yeah. take the features you don't have to waste all your time on on stuff where there's nothing exactly yeah so john do you have any other questions sir well i'm trying i've got all kinds of questions it's just are we gonna have time to get them all answered <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh so talk about the shriver case a little bit more did you did you guys ever make it on the ground there or what what happened with the shriver case i'll let dave you take that because i never made it on the okay. ground you did yeah, so Mike was out of the country the day when um, when we mobilized on that case. But um, the Shriver case, you know, we haven't been on the ground, but we've seen a whole bunch of um, the, uh, I suppose, the stuff that is uh, would be deemed classified about that case. And for us, it's just as easy as us getting out on that location. As Mike said, um, we know where it is in Maymont. It's right beside the Vietnam border. You've seen some of the information related to it oh, yeah. and it was exactly one of the cases that. so during the time that everything was closed down it was one of the cases that we were um that we volunteered to have a look at it was suggested i think you hit mute there david I think you muted yourself, David. David, you muted yourself. <laughs> He's having a great conversation with himself, guys. David, David's just going to town there. He muted his mic and he doesn't hear me. Dave, you're on mute, man. Oh, he's been having a good conversation, too. <laughs> it's the mute on StreamYard, David. On your screen. I mean, he can't even hear us, either. <laughs> he's got both his mute and his volume off. Yeah, I tried to unmute it, but it won't let me on my end, so. All right, well, we can go on. We, Dave will come back. Yeah, once he notices. 
Yeah. He's trying to figure it out. Yeah. Yep, there, back. Can you hear me, God? Sorry. You are. Boy, you were having a hell of a good conversation there, buddy. Yeah, oh, yeah. start over. <laughs> you want to you want to start that over? Oh, oh, you muted again, David. There you are. You're back. We got you, buddy. We can hear you, Dave. <laughs> we got you, David. Oh, oh. We can hear him, but he can't hear us. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, he was yeah, he was talking a little bit about you know seeing some of the classified info on the Shriver case. Now that brings up my next question is why is a lot of the stuff still classified? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I don't, I don't think it has nothing to do with the Vietnamese. It has absolutely nothing to do with the Vietnamese. This is all on, on us. So I have no idea why they would have kept all that classified for all this time. And you would think, isn't it after fifty years it's supposed to be declassified? That's that was my my understanding. So we're about there. He was texting me there, so he says he's out. I told him to come back on. Yeah, that that picture you have on on um, on the Facebook um, behind you that that's actually on PP Island, Thailand after the tsunami in two thousand, the late two thousand four, twenty six oh. December. So I, I led I led a search and recovery. We had two teams. We had a uh, my friend. Mass Sergeant Bryson, and he led the 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 oh, I was... fat the fit team. So we had the fit team and we had the fat team. So we deployed over to Thailand to look for the missing Americans that were killed in the tsunami in Phuket and uh, PP Island and and that whole area, Khao Kalat. And we stayed over there a while. But that that photo was actually on PP Island where the tsunami had come in and taken out that whole area. And there was a lot, quite a few people missing there. So that, that was a very interesting mission. Yeah, that would have been, that would that have been really interesting. Really interesting. So uh, how many recoveries have you done in, uh, in Laos? I, I, I don't even, I have no idea. I was, uh, I was the, um, the acting deputy commander and the, and the logistics NCO for the detachment there, but I did a lot of missions outside of that. So probably, probably about fifteen or twenty missions in Laos. Oh no, kidding! So I'm going to ask you that. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Do you? What are your What are your thoughts about did Did we uh, or did they transfer a bunch of our guys up to the Soviet Union? You know, I don't know. Um, like I said, I'm, I, I I was never on the the intel side. I, w I was never on the intel side or the or the investigative side of LK cases. So those those all fell under the last known alive LK case investigation, and those were typically done by all the Vietnamese ones were done by in Laos and Vietnam and Cambodia were all done by JTFFA. And so I didn't have any part in that. Um, I've heard, I've read pretty much what everybody else has read. And I would not doubt that early in the war, um, that that probably is very plausible. Um, I also think it's, it's even more plausible from the Korean war. Uh, yeah. and, and those, those guys would have been disappeared because of political reasons. And so that'll never come out. I'm sure. And, and you talk about why are these things still classified as far as the, the, the small stuff from the Vietnam war, you'll never, we'll never learn that. We'll, we'll never learn these LK cases that went to Russia. Um, you, you know, you had what Bobby Fisher, um, um, you had the guy in North Korea that came across, you know, came back in the nineties or early two thousands. Yep. You know, they, he had defected and they married him off to a 
Japanese school teacher they abducted off the coast there in Japan. <laughs> so North Korea is just, you know, it's, it's just like that. But once the people are over there and if they defect and stuff, they're, you know, we, we list them as LKA, but, but once you find out their fate and that they're still alive and that they opted to, to, um, Bobby Garwin, um, uh, who, uh, who's the other guy? Oh, that's uh, I'll, get, I'll, I'll get Dave in on this one from oh Clyde, Clyde McKay. Okay, yep. So you get guys like that where you know you're not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. I mean, you do an LKA because because somebody and you find out where they are. But the thing is, you can't do anything with that with that. So you can't really. It's illegal to to investigate live Americans overseas, and so you had this thirty day window to do the LKA cases. And and when these guys would come back, we did nothing to them because there's really nothing we could do to them. So the th you couldn't get into Russia to investigate any LK cases. And even if you could, the U.S. government wouldn't have done it because of the politics of it. You know, at the end of the war, if, if they were there, which I believe some of them probably were, they they would never made it out alive. And, and they're, they're not absolutely non-recoverable. Right. Right, because they would have disappeared on more than Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I know there was there was some a lot of good intel too from you know the CIA was, you know, had I found a lot of case files through the CIA stuff that, uh, you know, even in World War II, uh, MIAs or POWs, um, you know that, that it ended up in the Soviet Union and they're still mm -hmm. there. To, well, if they're still alive, they're still there today, but. They'd be pretty old men by now, but yeah. Um, have you ever read read Gar Bobby Garwood's book? I haven't. You should read 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 up on Bobby Garwood because you know he he came back in the eighties and said you know I, I've I've had I've memorized all these social security numbers. I was in a prison camp and all this kind of stuff. But the thing that he didn't know is is we had videotape captured Viet Cong videotape of him carrying weapons during a raid on American forces. Right. And so he right. ended up pumping gas at a gas station in Michigan. That was the last I heard of him. But there's nothing you could do to him because the evidence that you got, you couldn't have because you're investigating American live overseas. So, so right. these are the issues you get into with when you get into LK cases and stuff like that and defectors and things with like Clyde McKay. Right. He, exactly. he, he, Clyde met his just desserts. He did. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. Well, what else can you tell us? Any other good stories or? Uh, well, you, you know, I, I posted that thing on my Facebook page about about the the crash site in Bakma. Uh huh. And so, oh, that's right. So nobody had ever been on that site before, and and we were staying in Way, and driving into Bakma um, National Forest every day because they wouldn't let us base camp out there, which was great because, you know, we were staying in a nice hotel in a way. And so we drive about an hour and a half out there every day. And then we'd go, we'd walk down a nice, beautiful path. It, there was nothing rugged about the whole site, really. It was a national forest. And the crash site was, was down in this little ravine, um, small, you know, a, a decent slope, 20, 20 degree or so slope. And, and the, when the, when the, the plane had come in, it, it had it had hit the trees, and so it had broke apart. So there wasn't really a crash crater. It was just a, a debris fill, and it wasn't moving very fast because there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of film. It was a, a recon, and so yep. there was a lot of a lot of film on the top of the ground. Um, and we 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 correlated the aircraft. We correlated that the pilots didn't eject. And everything matched. And all it was was to excavate the site. Well, it's in a natural forest. We had to cut down some trees, but no no big trees. And it was on a slope. So you're only taking off 20 or 30 centimeters because we never really found the, the impact crater. Right. But I had a, a Navy um, comms guy with me. And we the only place we could do the, the MRSAT checks um, were up down the down the trail so every day a couple times a day i'd send him down to make a radio check back to hanoi and he comes back and he says hey i run into there's a couple 
you know, a couple American couple on the trail. I said, what? And he goes, yeah, there's an American couple down on the trail. And I said, well, what were they doing? Well, they were just asking questions about, you know, what we're doing here. And I said, okay, well, that's fine. We got nothing to hide. And then about a half hour later, I look over and I see them watching us, you know, and, and it's not a big site. I mean, it's really, really a small site compared in comparison to everything else. And we weren't, there were no mechanical equipment out there or anything, just some screens and, and some shovels mm -hmm. and workers. But um, the next morning, here comes a whole entourage, the Minister of Interior for Vietnam and all his staff and everything. And they show up down there and they said, you have to shut this down. You got to shut it down now. You know, you're desecrating. You're, you're, this is a national forest. And we left. And, and it was for years. I kept telling JPAC and um, Silha and JPAC that you, you've got to go back there. We found the blood chip the last day on the top of the ground. Half of a blood chip. I yeah. mean, I, you know, and so and the numbers matched um, the pilot. So but we, they never went back. And, and so when I saw that article come out about uh, about that pilot, I'm like, I know exactly where he is. It ain't a hard recovery. I'd love to go. I'd do that myself. I'd pay to go do that that site. You know? right. I would pay myself to go do that site tomorrow because I know exactly where where these guys are at. But I can't believe that after all these years, they still haven't recovered them. And so it, it was just amazing when I saw that article. I was like, man, you got to be kidding me. So they haven't even put another mission in there to even do a recovery or even Not, to look at it. It didn't sound like it, no. It yeah, was the family, the brother of the of the one of the pilots that was complaining. And when I, I read that, I'm like, I was complaining for years and years, you know, to the headquarters that we shouldn't never what they did, what they do, they they administratively close the site. Right. And whenever you hear administratively closed, it means it's politics. There's bodies there. We could recover it, but they don't want us to recover right now. That's, and, that's, and I that's figured that typically that goes on two or three or four years. And, and, the, but to, to read that and to know that they're still haven't gone in and recover these guys, I would go and do it tomorrow and it wouldn't cost them a penny, but they won't, let, they won't let you, they'll stop you. They'll physically yeah. stop you. And that's all because of a couple of American environmentalists. Well, well, yeah, the reason that we had to stop, the reason that we haven't started yeah. is all because of the, the politics and and DPA and their leadership and our, and our weak leaders um, that won't go and press. The, the Vietnamese would probably let you go in there tomorrow, but nobody's asking. So I'm glad this brother came up, and if the brother ever wants to contact me about that, I'd be more than glad to give him my two cents on it. Well, maybe we ought to get offline when we're offline. Tell me who the brother is, and I'll make that happen for you. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's in the. Um, I'll send you the link to it. And okay. de yeah, definitely, if you want to talk to him, I'll go in. I'll do the damn thing myself. As long as as long as he gives me the green light, I'm doing it for the family. I don't have to go through the government. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's crazy. That's crazy. You know, there. I think there's probably hundreds hundreds of recoveries just just like that. That you know, that we we could do North Korea tomorrow. The North Korean, well, not tomorrow, but in April, <laughs> you know, right. it falls out. But we, I mean, they won't stop us. It'll cost a little bit of money, you know. But if you're, you, you have the World Food Program and a lot of other places in North Korea today doing humanitarian work, this is no different. Get the politics out of it. Let people go and do what they need to do. Yeah, well, isn't that why they, they allowed the, the DPAA to do that instead of having to go through the State Department to start doing their own uh, deal? Well, yeah, but it, I mean, it was always kind of a State Department kind of led thing, even though you don't have a mission. In, in Pyongyang, you would go to the Swedish embassy. Right. They're neutral. So so anything we want to do, it'd have to go to the Swedish embassy and then come to us, and we have to go to the Swedish embassy and then have to go to North Korea. Because right. we didn't have we don't have any diplomatic relations, but if you're if you're a private organization an NGO, you can go directly to your counterparts on the North Korean side and say, okay, here's here's the humanitarian thing we want to come in and do, and will you allow it? I don't think to today if I did the meeting tomorrow that I that they would say no. They would say, okay, here's what we need on our side. 
right. which would be kind of minimal. You know, you know, we need some fuel oil. We need this, but you're only talking five, 10 million bucks. But if it gets you in there for five missions and you're recovering 30 or 40 a mission, you come out with 150 that JPAC DPA averages about $1.3 million per recovery. Exactly. So if I can go in and get 150 recoveries in the summer, that's, that's $200 million. Yeah. That it would cost them to recover that many remains and make an identification. I could do that for a quarter of the cost. Less, exactly. than, that, less than that. So why don't they do it? Why don't they let us do it? Yeah, well, that's been my heartburn all along, too. Uh, it's just like the forensic genealogy that I do. Uh, you know, I offered my my services free of charge uh, to the DPA and, and the Army casualty. And I was told, flat told by Army casualty, I can't I can't allow somebody to vol volunteer for something we already pay for. Well, I mean, you there's, there's a law about supplanting. However, that doesn't apply to volunteers the only the only the only law that you that they would have to look at violating is if you were going to do it anyway and you were going to have to pay people to do it and you and you opt to to take people and have them do it for free that doesn't cost you that's a planning government fund but if you're not going to do it and you opt to use people that'll do it for free it's not supplanting so there's no there's no bar to that and right. this was the, this was part of the whole thing I was telling them is I ain't asking for nothing. Right. We ain't asking for nothing. That's exactly you know? what I told them. Well, the Marine Corps never had a problem with using me. So mm -hmm. they're only allocated for 50 recoveries a year or 50 DNA profiles a year. That's all the Marine Corps is allocated for. So well, I, I just completed their Hellship project that they had, uh, you know, from World War II. You know, there was 54 Marines that they didn't have FRS for. And I just completed that here about a month or two ago. Well, one, one of the things that may, you know, in the future, if, if it, you never know what's going to happen five minutes from now, but if there's a international mass fatality that involves Americans, um, we can definitely get, get together because it's no different. The, re the reason I did um, the tsunami in Thailand and, and, and the, and the um, Haiti earthquake and the Bahama hurricane just a couple years ago, um, international mass fatality stuff is because that's that's what I like to do, and that's mm -hmm. what how I what I know, um, what it's what I know, and it's what I like to do, and it doesn't cost anybody anything for me to go and do it. But if you got guys like you and me that have the expertise to go and help, then why not? And and so it's always, you know, they welcome you with open arms. But why doesn't the MIA community do that when you have people that have the skills to go in and do it that aren't asking for anything except to get out of their way? Right. And and they won't. They they purposely step in your way as soon as they figure that out. Because the only reason I can think is because you're going to prove that you can do it better, faster, and cheaper. Yeah, and they're just sitting on a something that's job security for them. Exactly. And 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 the worst thing is, you know, being like like I was active duty military army living and working with the North Korean active duty military and army in their country and then being armed and us being not unarmed. And then the same way in Vietnam and Laos and, and Burma and New Guinea and everywhere else I've worked on recoveries, Iraq and everywhere else. It doesn't work that well when you're military. It works civilian to civilian, contractors to the government. Um, right. sending, sending military personnel into North Korea to live with North Korean military personnel when they're jabbing you in the gut every day and pushing you off the cliff, knowing that there's nothing you can do, is, is not what they do to the World Food Program people. You know? So so you could you could get a lot more bang for your buck if, if it wasn't this military-to-military -military type of thing. It's a humanitarian mission, no matter what country you go in, and get the military out of it. Yes, these are military service members that are missing. The military feels like they have an obligation to do it, but the military has an obligation to the American taxpayer to do it correctly. And they have an obligation to the family to do it quickly. And they're exactly. not doing either one of those. Exactly. Exactly. So how do we change this? I mean, I mean, it's you know, lobby. I mean, you have, you have to, I wouldn't go to Ann Mills Griffin. That's for sure. I've um, already been there. I've already been that route. You probably have too. I don't even want to bring it up. No, no. <laughs> I saw her last little, 
you know, when they were doing the, the armed services committee was, you know, had the DPA in front of them here, what last year. And then they won't mention the, you know, going after family for reference sample DNA, you know, for no. world war two. So no, we'll no, they, no, they've, they've lost the plot. They have lost the plot. It, I mean, it, it's, they're great. You know, the, I'm, nothing against the families of the missing. This is the league of families. Yep. It's the league of POWMI families. And that's what it should stay and always be. It should never be this political and they should never take the side of, of stalling tactics and allow them to stall because then you're not doing the families of the, of the living family members of the deceased, any justice at all. You're doing exactly. exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. So step out of the way, get out of the way, stop impeding and let new people come in that know what the hell they're doing. And they actually give a crap. Yep. Her brother's, her brother's been identified. Great. Great for her. She's 80. Go retire already. Let some other people come in that can fight the battle with these people that she obviously can't fight the battle with. Right. Well, she's too tied in with them, in my opinion. She's she is. And, and you know, um, well, they say absolute power, right? Corrupts exactly. absolutely. And, exactly. I, and I, I'm not I'm not talking about somebody I don't know. I'm talking about somebody that I've I've dealt a lot with. So, you know, people, this ain't something I read about somebody. This I know exactly how these people work and I've dealt with them and I've come to no positive re conclusion. And, and I, I think it's just best that we, that, that the government relook the entire process of what they're doing. And not the government, not the people that are doing it. It's external. It's like, if you look at that 20, what was it? 2017, 2016, um ig report on dpa uh -huh. it was yeah. it was damning it was. it was it was damning and they told them what they had to do you know what go back and look at it and see how much of that they've done nothing absolutely nothing they just thumb their nose at them and the ig needs to go back at them again and the ig needs to go and look at them and say yeah maybe maybe we're going to force you into trying some methods you that you've been reluctant to do and and to take some of the suggestions you've been reluctant to take and let some of these people go and do what they're willing to do. And let's do a study and see see how effect, how much more effective that they are than you are. And, and it's going to be a hundredfold. Get rid of the, the red tape and get rid of the bureaucracy and, and get rid of the, the dead weight that's up at the top of DPA and, and the League of Families and everybody else. And let us come in and do this. I'm not talking radical. I'm talking organized. Exactly. But there are plenty of people out there that are willing to go and do this that can do it without all this this drama and do it a lot faster and get closer to these families because at the rate they're going you're never going to end this and and in in 10 years no brother or sister probably very few from the world war ii are still going to be alive to get closure from their brother or sister that were missing in world war ii 10 years later korea 15 years later vietnam so 35 years from now, there ain't going to be nobody else alive that knew the individual that was missing, just like why they don't do civil war in World War One. Exactly. So, so, so what, if you don't speed it up, just stop it, just finish it and save the money. Yeah. Well, I do know some things that are happening on the, on the DNA side of things, you know, by, by some of the families um, that are working you know, I'm not going to reveal too much on here, but I'll I'll get offline and tell you about it. But uh, yeah, you know, not embracing modern techniques <laughs> and uh, you know modern scientific methods. You know, they're still stuck in the old ways, and and, and it's never going to change unless they unless they adapt. Yeah, and you know, even the GPR is not it's not really you know super modern technology and stuff. It's just it's another tool in your tool bag. Exactly. You know, you have the trial that you've been using for 4,500 years and you got a DPR that you've been using for 25 years. They're all a tool. One may work and find it and one may not, but why not use all of them? Why exclude things? And, and, and when you, you know, it, it's like in Lao, you know, I, I've been on sites where, where you're, 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 cr you're trenching, you know, special forces site, special op loss, special force losses, you're trenching. And then you're cross trenching and you're leaving 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter bulks and seven foot trenches. I mean, what are you going to do? Bury somebody standing up? 
in here. You know, there, there's, there's, there's so much better ways to find that. If they're here, use the GPR. But you're talking. I did three missions one time in Laos on a special forces site on this river, cross and trench and cross trench, and it was the hottest place I'd ever been. And um, on the last day, on the top of a pile in the middle of the trench. On her break, a worker looks and says, Oh, look at that. He pulls out a tooth from the very top of the pile. What are the odds of that? Yeah. This is after 90 days on the site. And so, and so you extend it, but, um, but they, they, they didn't, they didn't use any technology, any new technology on any of that stuff. And it's so frustrating. And it's all, you know, some of it's with individual anthropologists. There's some great anthropologists and archaeologists at DPA. Oh, and JPAC, I mean, really dedicated and great guys and gals. And I have really good friends. Um, and a, a lot of them don't agree with what's going on. They're getting a good paycheck and, and they love the mission. So they're not going to complain because as soon as you complain, you're out. Just yeah. like me, similar to me. As soon as you as soon as you say anything neg- negative, you know, or you question any of their their methods, you're you're outcast. And so you've got to go out on your own. So I don't blame any of the ones that are there that are that are sticking with this regime um, because they're dedicated to the job and they don't want to lose their job because once you're outcast, you're outcast. So um, there's a lot of us out there on the on the mortuary affairs side, the military side, civilians, um, anthropologists, archaeologists, stuff that that were that were cast aside. But it was because you were trying to tell them what they didn't want to hear. Yeah. Well, hopefully someday that changes. It's just finding the the right avenue to get it changed, I guess. Um, yeah, they got a clean house. They got a clean house, and and that IG report needs to be revisited because the the things that they were mandated to do, they never did, or they did it for a short time and they went back and they reverted. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, hell, you can't even find half the profiles on the website, you know, MIA profiles that they were supposed to put in there. Yep. You know, they control everything. Yeah, exactly. But but the American citizen part of it, you know, it's like Pupa tea. You know, that was all up and up. You know, they, they said, OK, you work with the University of Chicago, to Illinois. We did. They said, oh, you're going to work on Pupa tea. I told the university that I was going to go and recon the site on this day, there was no problem. When I got there, that's when all hell broke loose. And so it's just like the left hand not talking to the right hand and then being so afraid to, to think outside the box that once you did, once I did that to them, that was it. They were done. And, and there was almost no more contact. And this is after spending six months going and meeting with every deck commander um, personally in Laos and Vietnam and Thailand, um, in Hawaii and, uh, meeting with everybody to talk about how we're going to do this and everything was working so fine. But as soon as you, as soon as you seem like you're, you, you, you cross the line with them, that was it. And all it was, was, Hey, just to let you know, um, I'm near Pupati and I noticed some of your vehicles out here, you know, can you let your teams know that I'm in the area? And it was like a plethora of emails from lawyers and lawyers about how you can't do this. You can't, you got to leave. You got to, you got to leave now. Well, first of all, you asked me to come here. Second of all, this, this is on my dime. And third of all, I'm a private fucking citizen. I'm a PFC. Yep. And Poo T now is a tourist site that has a goddamn metal stairway all the way to the fucking top of it. <laughs> so you're telling me. That I can't go to Pupa T as an American citizen. No, you must leave right now. Now, how the hell can can, can DPA lawyers tell you get the hell out of Laos? I'm <laughs> I'm I'm an American citizen. I'm here trying to do something right for the family. And you kick me out of the country. And that's a goddamn fact. And I'll send you that email too. Oh, do <laughs> you will get you will get a kick out of this email. I do. Yeah. So who do you, what kind of contacts do you have over in Indonesia? Um, only one. And he is the um, the UN mass fatality, um, the lead for mass international mass fatality for the for the UN. 
And I met him in the Bahamas after the hurricane a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'll have to get offline with you on that one too then. Yeah, I, I can hook you up with him. He's you know, he's a British guy. But um but he's okay. I mean he's good to hang out and have a beer with and and he was there after the tsunami too. So he, he did all the stuff in, in Sumatra and Indonesia when I was in Thailand. So I got when I met him there, we had some great stories because he knew everything that happened on the on that side and then I knew everything that happened on the other side. But but yeah, he's there and he 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 has a lot of contacts, but I don't know. He doesn't really do anything with MIA stuff, but as far as contacts, he has a lot of contacts. Yeah, I've got a got a family that needs a plane wreck uh, dived on less than 60 feet of water. Yeah, let's talk. Yeah, yeah. the DPA won't, won't go in and touch it. They keep telling them, keep telling the family that uh, yeah, the relations aren't good there. So, In Indonesia? Yeah, that's what they keep telling the family. Okay, so they were just there doing a mission. Okay, so yeah, so the easiest way to to do is to get Dave because Dave's Australian, and Australians have good relations with the Indonesian, and let him go in and do it. Yeah, yeah, the family's actually ready to fly there themselves, and no, uh, don't let them, don't let them do that. I mean, we we can yeah. do it. We can do it. I mean, it depends on the COVID stuff, but um. I don't. I have no problem going. In. I'll, I'll go in and do it myself. I'm sure Dave will go in there if he can get out of Australia. But I think they're all locked down and shit. Yeah, they even they even bought themselves an ROV to take with them. Really? No, I'm not joking one bit. I'm not joking one bit, man. No, no. Let me know because even if you know if it's an underwater thing, I don't have a whole lot of experience in underwater. But but I, I know a lot of people that do. Yeah. That would probably. I, I know a couple that are actually in the area, not in Indonesia, but pretty close. Well, this is, yeah yeah exactly so yeah yeah any any of that stuff i mean i'm i'm all willing especially if it's a land if it's a terrestrial um but if if i can't do it i can definitely find somebody that that can help them with it because i keep in close contact with a lot of a lot of the guys because we were all geared up to go and um and to launch all the recoveries we had everybody medics and linguists and lsas and Mortuary Affairs guys, team leaders. I mean, we had everybody lined up, ready to go. All their shots, all their, you know, everything. Their bags packed. And DPA just said, nah. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it was so it was so upsetting. And it wasn't about the money. I mean, there, there is a cost to do something. Yeah. But that cost, that cost is so much less than what it cost them. You know, you're not looking at blade out, paying, paying the Vietnamese, you know, $200 per blade hour or way more, probably 2000 now. Um, you can renegotiate all this stuff yourself if they just get out of the way. Yeah. New Guinea is full of, full of crash sites. New Guinea is full of crash sites. Rabal, New Britain, um, the whole island. Uh, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't take a, a stroll without tripping over a propeller yep. in New Guinea. But they don't they don't want to mess with it. And and there's it's not New Guinea that's not wanting to do it. You got yeah. but you got some great groups out there, Bent Prop and the History Um History Flight. The History Flight. And the History Flight and Bent Prop would probably be very interested in the Indonesia thing, I would think. They've been approached. But yeah. They, I mean they should. But I mean if they don't want to do it, I'll go I'll go and do it. I can I can bring some people together and go and get it done. Uh, but there's some really good things. But what, what DPA has done with this public-private partnership, the PPP thing, is is they're they've gone to universities, and the universities got deep pockets, and they have they're training anthropologists and medics and you know medical people and all that kind of stuff. It's easier for them to fund a team to go out and do this stuff. But if you only do it ad hoc and once a year or you know once a semester, you, you don't you can't do it like that. Um, no, they no. they have the money, they have the deep pockets to do it, and they have the approvals because it's not costing DPA anything, but they're not they're not getting the results from it because they're not experts and they do it as part of their curriculum. Well, there are people out there that that are experts that that would just do it as a retirement hobby, like me. You know, right. that's, that's what we do, and and if they don't take advantage of it, it just may, it makes really no sense to me. 
Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I know the sure. University of Wisconsin's doing a few things over on the Eastern or European campaign stuff from World War II. And, yep. you know, they started using University of Utah a little bit on the forensic genealogy stuff, but I don't think there's been much going on there. But, mm. uh, you know, they, yeah, I think that when you can look at their public private partnership page and it lists all their all their public private partnerships. And usually when they have a, a family conference and stuff, they brief it and they put the PowerPoint slides up. So you can kind of see where they're at now. And, right. and, and, and I think what, what they were trying to do was to link up the universities with other nonprofits and for profits. So, so that you get, you get some professionals in there and it's kind of a, it's kind of a OJT. So you, you've got guys in there actually that know what they're doing. And then you got guys that are in there training and they're, and then you'll never see them again because they're doing their curriculum and they're going to graduate, but you have right. your, your core group. And, and so that's what we were trying to get at with the university of Chicago and Illinois. It was, okay, we, we understand that you're the people that you send us are always going to change, but we're always going to be the same. And, yep. and the way that we do things are always going to be the same because that's the, the industry standard. And so, so really it's a win-win because you've got these guys, of course, you're going to get paid because you're living in the jungle um, half the year. And, and, but also their, their instructors are getting paid. So, but it's nothing that it costs PCS and people to Hawaii for three years and send them on eight missions exactly, you know, and, and paying all that cost. It, that's why the government contracts a lot of stuff out because it just makes more sense um, financially. And, and it also expedites a whole lot of stuff. So, but they, that's the point we have to get to. And, and I, I I'm hoping that DPA will come around. Um, and I hope that the U S government comes around to, to tell them DPA and, and getting the IG involved again, to go back and look at where they're at with, with, what they we're told to do. And also some, some new things, um, and look into what happened with Sparrowhawk, um, Sparrowhawk global, um, MIA recovery group and, and some other people and try to tell them the mandate them that they're going to have to go and do this. You want to mandate Americans to wear a mask and get the damn shot and stuff, go mandate them to go recover bodies because exactly. they're not doing it. They're no, not. They're, man they're mandated 200 a year. The DPA was. And they, they well, 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 they are, but you know, you know, that that's easy when you're, you're only doing Oklahoma. Well, yeah, yeah. but they could even do it with Oklahoma. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 one year. and that's going to run out. And so, so now they're going to blame COVID. Oh, we can go. Well, all the stuff where you got the military, you're kicking them out because they've got to have COVID shots and and the military can't go travel overseas and you can't go into this country because of the, the U.S. military policy. Well, if they were, they were civilian contractors, you wouldn't have that problem. Yep. You wouldn't have that problem. They're working all over the world every day. But when you have the military involved with doing this type of stuff, it's just going to slow you down. And especially with COVID. So the whole time during COVID, you could have had contractors that fully vaccinated. We're going to go in, you know, to these countries and, and they would keep doing the mission. But they pretty much shut down for a long period of time. And so this 200 mandated 200 IDs a year, they've been they've been, you know, the, the Tarawa remain unknowns and the and the uh, Oklahoma unknowns and the. Uh, Go over there, Jack. <laughs> All right. Watch that fireplace. Jack got to stand by the fire. <laughs> oh, nice. Jack was in the army with me. We knew each other 36 years. Oh, no he, kidding. Yeah, he's visiting over here. Can I say that's part of the But the but but the, the Tarawa unknowns, the Oklahoma unknowns, uh, and all that kind of stuff. That, that's where that's where that's the easy pickings, you know, when you're doing the, the clavicles, yeah. you know, you're getting IDs off the sternums and the clavicles from the to, from the chest x-rays. And now you got the isotope testing. Those are going to run out. They're not going to be able to sustain 200. And so either you lower the number that you have to mandate a year or you find other resources to get that. And, and yeah, lower, nice. lowering the number of IDs per year would make no sense. Might as well dissolve the whole organization. If you can't do 200 a year when you've got 200,000 missing. Well, that's why they're doing the cherry pick in the world war two, uh, you know, little 
you know, like Cabatatuan and yep. and the Hill Chips and the low hanging fruit. The low hanging fruit. And yep. you know, they still they're they're just putting them off to the side until all these other ones run out and then they'll start working on these so they can make meet that two hundred a year. And and all these families are still sitting there waiting, like what the hell's going on? Yeah, you know, if if I was in my last years of life with them, I hope I'm not, but and I was missing an uncle or somebody that I actually knew, um, a close family member, my grandpa, um, my dad. I could not, I could not deal with the pace of of their identification. I mean, I would be such an advocate um, with the League of Family and stuff, or with any other group. But the Pupati families aren't aren't a fan of Ann Mills Griffith. They're not a fan of the League of Families, and they need to get their own little pressure going on right there because I, I I will no problem tomorrow send them the proposal that I gave to DPA to finish that site yeah. and, and explain to them what happened after that, how DPA shut us down and then went and took our contacts in Lao and tried to use them to go and pay, pay them more money actually right. to go and do what we had them doing for cost. Right. So, so yeah, there has to be an, an organized movement of people like us that, that don't really care about the repercussions about going against them. And really, I don't care. What are they going to do to me? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, we've been on here two hours. I was looking at that clock behind you. It's 10 o'clock after you're after 10 yeah. o'clock time. So I better let you get off here. And, you know, All right, brother. Well, it's been great. It's been great talking to you. Well, I did. I appreciate it. It's great meeting you and, and, having you on here and uh, I'm sure I'm going to try to get you back on here again too, you know, and pick your mind on some more of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, there's some, there's some certain things. There's some certain sites, you know, that I'd like to delve into a little bit. Dave, Dave is, uh, Dave is so knowledgeable about Cambodia and, and Vietnam and the history. And he's such a, he, he's such a great investigator that I can't add any more than he can ever add to that. But as far as, as far as history and field techniques and stuff, I definitely, I definitely, I've got some stories. And then even if we venture into, you know, um, current combat stuff in Iraq and and that type of stuff, I got some a lot of interesting stories about that too. Oh, that'd be neat. Yeah, that would be neat. Yeah, I found found Dave some U two U two uh, photographs of a bunch of stuff in Cambodia that really piqued his interest and. I'm surprised they don't use that stuff when you're when they're doing the investigative elements. You, you would think that Stony Beach would be all over that, but I don't know. Yeah. It's like I said, I'm I don't do the intel stuff. Dave is great at it, but but he comes up with so much stuff that they missed. You know, a lot of the intel about Cambodia and talking about that these people were taken to, taken to Angkor, and and the and the analysts would say, oh, they went to Angkor Wat. No, they didn't go to Angkor Wat. You know, he, Dave's the one who figured out Anchor was headquarters. That's the head guys. It had no, yep. it wasn't a location. It was a group. Yep. And and he found so many of those and, and it led people in so many of the wrong directions about what happened to these, these MIAs. And, um, and he figured that out. So now it's, it's well known um, in the analyst world there that, that, they don't just when they say Anchor, they don't think of Anchor Wad. They think of the headquarters, the headshed. Exactly. But nobody, nobody really knew that before. Yeah, well, and you know, on the on those dragonfly or the U two flights, you know, they were doing all that mapping and stuff, and and the photographic of all these, you know, the headquarters in Cambodia, the different bases and things like that, and and why aren't the, why isn't Stony Beach using that stuff to do these investigations? Yeah, well. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have anything bad to say about Sunny Beach. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of resources out there that they could go out and reach out to that they, they actually, their best people have and, and they've scored big on them, but they've been shut down by the politics that are involved. So yeah. You've got some great analysts with Stony Beach that are out there really trying to do the right thing and have gotten to the right people. But once they did, the politics stopped them in their tracks. And, yeah. and with all the right intentions and what would have yielded great results, um, 
were just stopped because of politics. And and the politics came from the Sill High side or the DPA side. And and that's unfortunate because the, there's always a rift between Stony Beach and DPA, Stony Beach and JPAC, Stony Beach and DP at Sill High and JTFFA and Sill High and, and all all that. There's always been this rift there. And there is today that remains with with Stony Beach and DPA because you have one on one side a humanitarian effort for the families, and on the other side, you're dealing with intel. Right. And it's always a disaster when those two meet. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's within the State Department, it doesn't matter if it's in anywhere you bring intel into a real world humanitarian type of real world type environment where they're supposed to be transparent, it just doesn't work. So so it has the whole the whole thing has to be relooked. They have great analysts and stuff, but but once once um they get too far out of the box, they reel them in. Even though no matter what kind of progress that that they were making, they stop them, which is right. truly unfortunate because these these Stony Beach analysts are really dedicated in what they're doing and and they they know how to to get to the bottom of cases and use the resource at hand. But once you stop them from doing it, you threaten them and you threaten the people that they go after to try to help them, then then why do you even have them? Right. Right. Well, sir, again, I appreciate it. And I'll go ahead and let let, let us get off here and and uh, but stick around there for a minute while I shut everything down. And I'll talk to you a little bit more for a minute, if you don't mind. OK, sure. Um if anybody wants to reach out and ask you questions, I got a lot of family that listen. You know, what's the best way to contact you? Uh, it's probably best if they can send it through your website if you have. A, I do. And you can forward it to me. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm trying. I don't want to conflate with my my current occupation with with this other this other hobby. Gotcha. Because I'm I'm still involved with the government here at a at a certain level, and I don't want to. You know, I don't. I, I really want to help families, but I, I I want to do it off to the side. Yeah, yeah, understood, understood. Yeah, that's why I kind of we didn't bring up initially what your current occupation was. So yeah, and, but, and I uh, have a great job, and I'm still helping military and veterans and their families and stuff. Yes, sir. Yeah, and I appreciate it too. So, all righty, sir. Well, again, um, appreciate you being on and. It's too bad we lost David in the middle of it. I lost him last week too in the middle of it. So uh, Dave's got to go smoke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm gonna have to get him a new microphone. You can tell him to get rid of that Yeti. So. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much, John.